just thought I'd provide a bit of context around this discussion. So, uh, you know, when you saw uh, Byron's remarks around the number of users that CIRA is helping to protect from threats, um, it kind of uh, makes it clear why this is such an important topic today. So, um, a big part of my life is spent uh, writing about the latest security threats uh, for a publication called uh, Security Intelligence, which is read by chief information security officers and, uh, and people on, on security teams. And the nature of those threats is constantly changing and, and becoming uh, much more difficult to defend against. Uh, I'll give you an example of something that I published uh, yesterday. A couple of weeks ago, uh, a group of citizens based in the UK received an email that purported to be from Her Majesty's Revenue and Customs Agency, or HRMC, so essentially the, the tax uh, agency for the UK government. The email didn't have a subject line, but it told those who received it that they were eligible for a refund of 546 pounds. The caveat was they had to act on this the same day that they got the email. And to do it, they had to click on a link that was in the email, which would take them to the um, HMRC website, and they had to fill out a bunch of information. This was not a real uh, email. It did not actually come from the government. And when people clicked on it, they wound up on a page that was made to look like that government agency site. And there they had to fill out uh, things like their name, date of birth, um, social security information, and so forth, including their credit card uh, information, supposedly to verify the transaction. That's not unusual. In the security business, and some of you will know this, we call that a phishing scheme. It's a way to get information out of people. What was a little unusual in this particular case was that before you even got to the fake government website, you were taken to what looked like the login for your online email. If you used Microsoft Outlook, for example, uh, you would see a screen pop up saying, please enter your username and password, and then you get to go to the site. So in this case, the cyber criminals were, were kind of combining two different sorts of techniques, uh, one of which was just to steal data, including credit card information. The other was to get uh, login access to everyone's email accounts so they could then go into their contact address and send more emails to all the contacts that they would have uh, in their, their own personal uh, email list. So, uh, it's an example of why this topic is so important and just how sophisticated some of the threat actors that are doing this are becoming. So we're, gonna, we're not going to be able to solve all of the security problems just from this panel, even though we have a fantastic one. Uh, but I hope that we'll at least start to talk about some ways you can start thinking about uh, protecting your own organizations and your, your customers online. So I'm going to uh, just briefly introduce our panel. I actually, I, I kind of introduced Nicole at length, so I'm, I'm going to not not re redo that because uh, I think you probably all remember her, but I'm really glad you can stay with us for, for this uh, part of the session. Uh, immediately, I guess, to, uh, well, I guess my left uh, is Amanda Maltavy, who is Canada Post General Manager, Compliance and Chief Privacy Officer, which is still a relatively new role we've seen in many organizations. She's responsible for compliance in areas of privacy, records management, uh, anti money laundering, and access to information. Uh, next to her uh, is, in some respects, a, an old friend, uh, although we're not often in the same room together, but uh, Michael Geist is a law professor at the University of Ottawa, where he holds the Canada Research Chair in Internet and E-Commerce Law. He's also a syndicated columnist on technology law issues, with his regular column appearing in the Toronto Star and Law Times. I have personally uh, reached out to Michael, I don't know how many times, for insight on all manner of things. Uh, security uh, and privacy, so I can personally uh, bet uh, you know how, how great he is uh, on these subjects. And finally, uh, and certainly not least, uh, Dave Chiswell, uh, who is Sierra's VP of Product Development, and he leads uh, Sierra's development of new products and service offerings that are core and align with um, the .ca registration service. He's also a seasoned technology veteran in his own right and with extensive experience in the internet industry. So thank you all for, for joining us today. So just as a very basic uh, high-level question, we heard um, you know, all kinds of different threats mentioned from ransomware. Uh, some people were talking uh, in the Q&A just now about uh, the use of VPNs and all those things. I think for the average uh, entrepreneur who's trying to grow the company and hopefully be as successful you know, as an OMX, they're just trying to work on their business. And hearing all these threats can be quite overwhelming and a sense of how, where do you even begin. 
I was wondering if some of you could just chat about, you know, just from maybe what you've learned in your own organization or from observing trends in the industry, what would you suggest for, you know, small, medium-sized business in Canada, which is most of them, um, who are trying to build an online presence, what are some of the ways they can start to wrap their heads around these threats and take some proactive steps to start securing the information? And maybe I'll just start down uh, with you, if that's okay. I hate to, someone has to be first. I, I, I knew I didn't want to sit last. Uh, I'm, I'm turned on in this? Um, that's a great question, um, and I think the universe out there is really sufficiently complicated that it's, there's no one easy answer. Um, the way I typically answer that question when people ask me is, you've got to develop a spidey sense. You have to assume the fact that what's happening on your internet, whether it be through your inbox or through your browsing activity, might have some element of maliciousness. So, um, you know. Take, take, take that set of information and, and give it a little bit of a critical eye before you click, or before you read, or before you go uh, enter information. Um, you know, I have an 83-year-old mother who's been subject to the CRA scams. Uh, she's had her computer hacked a couple times. And uh, I've got anti-spam, antivirus, all the software on her computer, but the biggest uh, prevention tool I've been able to teach her is to ask why or be 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 somewhat skeptical of what's coming in, and and that's helped a lot. So definitely spidey sense on what's going on out there on the internet. Uh, Michael, I feel like you and I have talked about some of these practices, and I think they're all good ones, but for literally 20 years. Why aren't we developing that spidey sense more effectively? What are some ways we can accelerate that process? Well, I think you highlighted in your opening remarks how. Uh, even as people become better at some of these things, the people on the other side, the cyber criminals or others, become more sophisticated and find new ways to be effective in trying to extract some of that information. I, I, uh, your question, I thought, was targeted to some of the smaller and medium-sized businesses in addition to end users. And it strikes me that, that many of those businesses face a bit of a, a conflict. I mean, they, they might have heard the fantastic keynote that started off this morning. Uh, about the value of data and this desire to say, I want to capture and extract as much data from my customers as possible. There is a privacy side on the other side, though. And when you think about security breaches and the reputational harm that that can create for a business, if you don't have that personal information, there are far less risks uh, associated with the prospect of some of those breaches. And even if you do, if you haven't taken appropriate steps to anonymize that information and ensure there's appropriate security, you're, you're creating for yourself your own set of risks. And so you've got a little bit those competing, uh, those competing issues in a sense, on the one hand, incentives to capture, and on the other hand, increasingly recognize that there are real risks in doing so given the security threats that you face as, in a sense, a, a guardian or a trustee over your customer's information. Uh, I mean, I think most people, you know, might associate Canada Post with, you know, physical mail and paper, but you manage a ton of data, postal code data, and all that sort of thing, and you enable merchants uh, as well. What kind of lessons have you learned that might you might be able to pass on uh, to some of those uh, SMBs who, who rely on Canada Post, but also a number of other uh, digital services and how they can protect themselves? Yeah, thanks for the question, and uh, thanks for the invitation to be here today. Um, Maybe a couple of thoughts, and just maybe picking up a little bit on um, what um, Michael had to say. And uh, it's, it's true for small and medium-sized business, but I think also for large enterprises is, um, you know, it's the cost of security. So if you're going to collect all of that information, um, it's the cost of really uh, investing in the security to be able to protect it. And I think that's a conversation that we have increasingly sort of with our, um, with our customers, and I think also internally we talk about that. Um, I think another thing maybe to, to think about, and again, this sort of plays across uh, you know, small and large organizations, but I would say know your partners, and, and that's sort of a key one um, as it relates to sort of the so-called data ecosystem. So understanding who it is that you're going to be sharing your customer information with, um, their own practices, um, and you know, doing a little bit of your own due diligence as it relates to their performance, as it relates to breaches, as it relates to 
Um, you know, do they have visible privacy and security practices available, or do they have something they can show you as it relates to your own uh, due diligence in terms of knowing, knowing who it is that you're doing business with? And uh, so, Nicole, uh, you know, one of the standout uh, parts of your speech for me was just the discussion around the increased connectedness of everything. You talked a lot about the IoT and just, you know, how everything can be digital, which is fantastic. You could also argue it, it creates a bigger potential target for threats. So as a business owner, how do you kind of survey that yourself and, and make sure, because you're dealing in a market where I would think there's a very low tolerance for, you know, a data breach of any kind. Yeah, our business specifically would have a very low tolerance. I think for everyday small businesses, there's some really basic stuff that can do a lot though. And the first one is really just passwords. Like it's, it's crazy how much just having a really simple password and then not changing it and then having the same password for everything you're using and that password being the login to your company, you know, for us, everything's in the cloud. That, just getting a hold of passwords for all the employees is to me a really big thing. So we use LastPass and we force these really complex passwords that you would never be able to remember anyways, and then we force the auto uh, changing of passwords, and every password has to be different, and you don't pass a certain, each employee has to, every month they get like a little report card on how they're doing with all their passwords. So I would say passwords is a big one. We rely on external third parties for a lot of our stuff. Um, you know, logging onto the internet from a public place through Tunnel Bear. Um, we do third-party audits, we do LastPass, we, there's a bunch of other things that I'm drawing a blank on right now, but there's a bunch of tools that we're using for maintaining some of our own cybersecurity, and then um, we have cybersecurity insurance as well, which is a real thing now. It's almost as big as business interruption insurance, it's pretty much the same thing. Um, and so, yeah, it's, and it's an ever-evolving thing. I think you need a leader in your company to be really on top of it, to know that it's always changing. So uh, it's not just a matter of organizations protecting you know, the data that they produce. They're also increasingly, and as, again, as Nicole kind of showed in her keynote, they're handling information from other parties like their customers, which has obviously raised a lot of uh, major concerns, not just about security, uh, security but privacy. You know, how will this information uh, be handled and, and where might it end up and, and all uh, that sort of thing. And it, it's kind of a uh, balance between the two uh, things, security and privacy. Um, I mean, I think, you know, Canada Post is arguably one of the most trusted organizations uh, in Canada. You know, what are you seeing in terms of trends around uh, privacy, things that may be red flags that businesses should bear in mind as they're starting to digitize data and gather information from their customers? Anything that, you know, from, as a Canada Post, um, from a Canada Post perspective that you've done to, you know, ensure that only it's only used at the right place at the right time and so on? Um. Yeah, so maybe I'll tackle the first part of your question, which is around, um, you know, I guess what people are thinking about privacy. And I always answer this question sort of from the perspective of um, we're all consumers. So, you know, I think the types of things that we expect businesses to be doing more right now, which is to be more transparent, you know, really around what it is that um, they're doing with information uh, and your personal information in particular and who they're, who they're sharing it with uh, and how they're using it. I think that is, um, and that's a challenge for, for organizations as well, in terms of, uh, you know, understanding their expectations of their customers. Also, you know, what are the regulators asking for? And what are we um, looking at as it relates to some of the larger, um, you know, privacy issues that are taking place right now? And I think Facebook being one, and certainly looking to see what those big companies are doing right now, just to try to address transparency, and whether or not they're meeting all of our expectations. I think that's one. I think the other um, key one is, um, uh, is sort of a little bit kind of related, but I would say it's around, you know, consent. And, uh, you know, how do you maintain, how do you obtain meaningful consent from your customers as it relates to um, their personal information? Uh, and, you know, in the old days, I mean, there was, you know, you'd collect the personal information, you'd have a primary use, you'd use it for that purpose, and essentially, um, you might have one other business partner, um, you might share it with, but essentially it was pretty, um, uh, it was pretty confined. I think now um, that concept of consent is more challenging as it relates to, to data and technology and how do we obtain that. And I think what plays into that is control. So I think what we're seeing that certainly our customers are asking for and consumers that we interact with is, um, you know, give me that um, control over where it is you're sharing my information uh, and a point in time of which I can make a decision about what it is that you're doing 
uh, with my information and, and the relationship that I have with, with, have with you as well. So there, as some people uh, in the audience and on the webcast may know, there have been uh, a number of regulations, because the managers brought that up, to try and address some of these issues. Obviously in Canada, um, we have CASEL, the Canadian anti-spam legislation, and recently uh, there was an European Union uh, regulation, the General Data Privacy Regulation, that would affect not only people in the EU, but any organization doing business with customers in the UK around how they um, obtain consent uh, for the use of, of people's uh, information. Uh, Michael, I know that you look at this space a lot. Uh, you know, ba I realize it's early days as well, but since you know the introduction of GDPR and since we've had Castle in place for a number of years, are you seeing signs of progress in terms of privacy protection? Um, or are there some other gaps that, that need to be addressed and closed? Well, I, I'm mindful of the keynote that suggested that we need to be optimistic about things. <laughs> um, but I must admit, I'm not all that optimistic on that particular issue. Actually, Amanda and I served together on the anti-spam task force many years ago, and, and it's hard to be an optimist when it took the better part of a decade to get any sort of legislation and to still see the number of businesses that have frankly stand, stood opposed to uh, strong anti-spam rules and real penalties. In fact, uh, while the AGM was taking place about 35 minutes ago, the Privacy Commissioner of Canada released his annual report on PIPIDA. Um, as part of that, he announced that he's filing a, a, a reference to the federal court to see whether or not the right to be forgotten, which is part of that GDPR that you talked about, the, the notion of being able to remove search results is already found within Canadian law. That's a position he takes but not everyone agrees. And he expresses in that report an enormous amount of frustration um, with the current set of rules, the lack of power that the commissioner has, and frankly, the, the really very slow speed that we've been moving uh, in terms of trying to update some of our rules. So I think it's true that the, the level of awareness has increased. It is certainly the case that the kind of concerns that people have with respect to privacy have increased, and, and perhaps there will be even more exposure when the security breach rules, uh, mandatory reporting of those breaches that we passed in Canada take effect on November the 1st, so we start receiving those notifications, that too will, I think, raise awareness. Um, but for whatever reason, uh, I think, and it's, it's blame that can be shared by political parties across the spectrum, this hasn't been an issue that has been prioritized in the same way that it has perhaps in Europe, and, and that's why you see leadership there, and here, I think we're kind of stumbling along still. Um, I just want to make mention that uh, we are uh, completely open to questions from the audience uh, for this session. So if you have a question, just uh, raise a hand and we will have people, uh, we actually do have people with mics uh, in the room and they're happy to uh, come to your table and uh, so that you can ask a question. Also, if you are watching on the webcast, uh, feel free again to type your question uh, in the box uh, on your screen and we'll get uh, to questions uh, from, uh, from there uh, as well. I actually think we have one uh, just over here, this uh, gentleman. Thank you. <clears throat> uh, thinking back to the 90s, I thought of the internet as a distributed service, uh, and it seems to have become extremely uh, centralized under the management of monopolistic corporations. Uh, do any of you think that it could become a utility rather than a, pr a product of a private corporation? So essentially, just to sum up the question, can the internet be sort of privatized and centralized to such an extent that there would obviously be some downside to that? I'm actually going to throw that, because we have a serial person here, and that seems right within your wheelhouse. Right in my strike zone. Um, and actually from a previous life. So I'll say that the inter internet is a utility today. And uh, I'll ask a few simple questions. We had a terrible power failure in Ottawa last weekend. How many people were really upset by the fact they had no lights? How many people were upset that they had no internet? Um, the problem with classifying the internet with utility is unlike water and sewage and uh, electricity, those are all clean and trusted. The internet is not. So that, and so that's the gap that we're really trying to bridge at this point in time, is how do we keep that internet source of information coming in and making it trusted in a way that uh, the tap water is here in Ottawa, 
and or when you flick on the light switch, it's not going to create a surge and burn your house down. Um, I'm going to take a question uh, from the uh, from our audience online, and just for the team at the back, um, I think we've addressed the one on GDPR, so we'll, we'll move to uh, this from Kath Catherine Williams. She asks, is there a good or better way to handle a client who insists your business impose certain types of security measures for your entire company when those restrictions limit your business? Um, so, you know, there's all kinds of different um, frameworks and standards that are uh, in place and, you know, it's kind of voluntary. So, uh, she says a sp specific example of this is a company that insists your company not use cloud computing <laughs> due to perceived security risks inherent in cloud computing. I'm actually going to give that to you, Nicole, because as a business owner, I don't know if that's something you've ever faced, but I, I think you might have some perspective on how best to respond. I think every single major client we've ever signed, there's been a, a battle over this up front. Um, you know, even talking to the government, they've mandated cloud first, but they don't have a way to deem protect, how to put protected B data into the cloud yet. So it's, it's, a, it's a huge challenge. I think there has to be... For instance, we had a client that decided they wanted our entire application within their own firewall on their own servers. And then, and they insisted on this for months and months and months, and we w obviously we couldn't do that. And so they came to our office, they traveled, and they did a deep dive on the application. And then finally, the CTO of this company realized that if they were to do that, it would ruin all the collaborative elements of the application. And you know, there's really, it's, it's like taking your own version of LinkedIn and putting it behind your firewall. So, I think you can have conversations with them about, but um, unfortunately, that just increases your cost of doing business. You usually have to jump through the hoops, all the security audits, and then you have to increase your price to accommodate for all those audits and, and, and ongoing uh, reporting that you have to do r related to their security requirements. I just I have an additional thought on this because I was smiling because I think I've seen this before. And I also think the question that we get asked is around um, the location of data. Mm -hmm. So I think that often comes up. And I, um, I think it's important when you have conversations with, uh, with the company or with your business partners is to make sure that you have um, the legal team in the room or if you've got in-house or you have you know, counsel that you're relying on. Because often what happens is that uh, some of the decisions that are made by organizations um, are very centralized, right? It tends to be a policy decision of the organization. So what I found when we're having these types of conversations is really to make sure that you're being strategic about who you're having in the room and, and, and who you're talking to about this, because it might not be the security team that's made that decision. It might be a board, it might be, um, you know, it might be some legal advice they've received. It could be ways in which they're interpreting their own risk. So I think it's, I think it's a little bit about if, you know, understanding about where it is that they're coming from as well, because I think often that gets lost a bit in the translation of the conversations. Absolutely. Um, there was some talk this morning in the keynote and I think in some of the other um, discussions about some of the newer technologies. So, you know, we just heard about cloud computing, but, you know, there's a lot of uh, focus right now on things like artificial intelligence and machine learning and just ways to, you know, be even more advanced in how we um, manage transactions and that sort of thing. As things like AI become more prevalent, what will the impact be on security? Because essentially, you know, more things are being automated. There's this potentially less human eyes on things. I, I will open this up to anybody, actually. If any thoughts, I guess, on, you know, it, we're struggling as it is, I guess, to just to stay uh, private and secure with traditional websites doing traditional things. How are we going to survive in a world, you know, where machines are doing a lot of the work? I'll try that one. Sure. Uh, it's a game changer, um, big time. I think we, the graph we saw earlier which says we're at like 17%. Um, some practical examples. So in some of the security products we use, um, millions of queries uh, on the web get uh, analyzed and reviewed every second. And AI slash machine learning takes that wealth of information creates some um, security protocols and or uh, block lists associated with where good, good traffic is and where bad traffic goes and updates policy servers every 15 minutes. So that's, that's the good news. The glass half full is, you know, we're using this technology to our advantage. The bad news is the bad guys are using the te this technology to their advantage as well. 
Um, so a university here in Canada has 60,000 accounts. They get over a million password uh, fraudulent attempts at those accounts a day. So AI and machine learning is also being used on that front. So arms race was the word you used earlier. I nodded completely. Um, it's on both sides. Uh, we have a question up near the front, if uh, we could have a mic. Yeah, right um, in the uh, front row. Thank you. Uh, so I have two question combined because I think they go well together. So what is too much data collecting in Canada legally and more generally morally? And also, uh, what's the best way, in your opinion, uh, to be transparent about the data you collect? Because I'm a web and multimedia developer, and my, my, most, my uh, main job is just to build websites for companies. This is an excellent question. So, you know, everything is supposed to be data-driven. There's a real push on to, you know, use as much as possible. How much is too much, and, and to what extent, you know, does that jeopardize things? Anybody want to, to be the first to, to weigh in on that? Well, I, I would start even by noting that our, our privacy laws have long said you can only require the information, personal information, that's strictly necessary to complete the service. It's why years ago you used to fill out different surveys and they'd be inclined to ask things like, how much education do you have, and what kind of car do you drive, and what are your earnings, and a lot of those kinds of questions from those sorts of surveys have over time started to disappear, or at a minimum they're now optional. Um, and I would tell people not to answer them or give fake answers. Um, but, by, so, and, but that reflects the fact that uh, our laws have shifted towards some amount of data minimization, at least in terms of what we're obligated to disclose, recognizing that the more we disclose, there are some, some risks associated with that information being misused at different times. Now, consistent with, that early, with the earlier discussion, I recognize from a website or business perspective, there is that that built-in incentive to say the more I know about my customer, the better I can serve them, uh, the better the opportunities are for them and for me to have more data and perhaps to even use some of the kind of machine learning AI type technologies. And so while I don't know that there is a, a right or wrong about where you draw the line, um, the test that, that, that I often think about is if something goes wrong, would I be comfortable with that being exposed on the front page of the newspaper or you know, widespread, the widespread reputational hit that might arise. With one of the real questions being, why did you ask for and store that information in the first place? And so I think that's a, the, the answer to that is going to differ between organizations. I think the important thing actually is to ask that question. Because too often there's you know, if I build it, I can, they'll come and I can take what I want, and who knows, maybe down the road it'll be useful. Uh, without, I think, enough recognition of the risks for the business, inherent sometimes in collecting, storing, and retaining that information, and of course the risks that the end user faces sometimes in disclosing that information. Excellent. Yeah. Yeah, I just, I would probably actually turn that on its head a little bit and say, sure, I'd say, um, how much, how much data is too much data? So for everybody that's on their phone right now, and for everybody that's looking at social media, and maybe is contributing to the conversation related to what's happening in the states right now, and your judiciary committee, and how you're feeling, and likes, you're providing the data. So there's just an example, I think, of um, for all of us to say that, you know, we're all data engines. Um, you know, and I'm not that I'm going to sort of be the big privacy advocate here and privacy paranoid, but I think it's something for us to think about as it relates to, um, you know, what it is that we're providing on a daily basis as it relates to, you know, contributing to um, an awful lot of data that's being uh, collected and used, um, certainly in Canada, but also I think globally as well. So it's very hard to cover off uh, everything to completion in a short time frame like this. But I think we have touched on everything from data collection to regulation, basic privacy and security protection, uh, and breach disclosure. Um, I know that uh, Nicole has to get on a plane, but I think our other panelists are around for the next few minutes anyway. Um, I would highly recommend you take advantage of them and uh, ask them you know, some of your more detailed or pointed questions. I know they'll be happy uh, to assist you. But please join me uh, in thanking our panelists for being part of this today.